Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching Hannibal Part 8, The Battle of Augur Falernus by History March. So, last time we asked the question, why didn't Hannibal attack Rome? We got some of the reasons why he may not have marched on Rome. We discussed whether it was a good idea or not a good idea. Now we've moved past that onto the next part of Hannibal's Italian campaign. So, if you guys end up enjoying this video, I would appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, which is linked down below, and will give you access to exclusive reaction content. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's jump right into this episode. It's late in the year 217 BC. Destroyed towns and burned farmland stretch as far as the eye can see. Mm. Hannibal had plundered the Aga Falernus Valley, perhaps the richest region in all of Rome. Ooh. But he is now surrounded and trapped by a more numerous Roman army, led by a general who seems to know all about his old tricks. Now, surrounded, trapped, more numerous opponent. <laughs> These are things that Hannibal has dealt with before. That is not necessarily new. I mean, he's been trapped in enemy territory for a while now. He has been fighting his way through. He's fought many armies that are far numerically superior to his own, and Hannibal has won every single one of those battles, but an enemy that knows his tricks, that could be a challenge, because so far, what has gotten Hannibal through this campaign is, I mean, his leadership, but also his ingenuity, his ability to think outside the box when presented with two options to make his own way. I mean, that's why he's such a great general. If the Romans start working out what exactly he's doing, if they can predict his actions, that would be very bad. With cold weather approaching, the Carthaginian general is running out of time. Uh-oh. And, I mean, you know, though I said Hannibal has been trapped in enemy territory for a while now, and he's been winning battle after battle after battle, it's still a risky position for him to be in. Um, I've reiterated this several times, but even if he is triumphant and victorious, he's still in hostile territory that still presents a risk to him. Now, of course, while Hannibal is in Roman territory, he represents a risk to the Romans. So it's not like either side is in comfortable territory, but, you know, Hannibal is in a dangerous position, even with all of his victories. It's summer, 217 BC. Mm. Having decided not to march on Rome, Hannibal went back across the Apennine Mountains. He ordered that all military-aged Roman males that were encountered on the march were to be killed. Oh, wow. Yeah, that is a real campaign of terror. <laughs> I mean, Hannibal has already very much frightened the population of Rome. I mean, they are probably terrified of him. Um... I'm not sure if I'd say they're downtrodden, but I'm sure morale is quite low generally, though the Romans continue to hold on to that fighting spirit, but, you know, killing uh, any, basically any fighting Roman, or any Roman that could potentially be a fighting Roman that they come across, that's a, you know, that's going to frighten people even more, or maybe harden their resolve, I don't know. But the Carthaginian general had reasons to worry. His army fought in three battles without ever fully recovering from the crossing of the Alps. Mm. And by now, the men... I mean, that was absolutely destructive, right? We saw that. I mean, it's one of Hannibal's most famous moves, the crossing of the Alps. And it absolutely served him well, but they're right. It absolutely crippled his army. And he's been given, you know, some time to rest and recuperate in small quantities but he really hasn't gotten an extended period, uh, the extended period of time that he would need in order to bring his army back to what it once was. Though, of course, the men remaining are extremely hardened veterans in top-tier fighting shape. ...showed signs of scurvy, and the horses of mange 
both Ooh. caused by vitamin deficiency. Right. After ten days, the Carthaginian army reached the Adriatic Sea. Mm. Hannibal allowed the men to rest and recover through <laughs> eating the plentiful produce gathered from this rich area. Yeah, they were eating good. And, you know, we just mentioned his crossing of the Alps. Let's think back on how far Hannibal has come. I mean, of course, Carthage, the city of Carthage, is stationed in North Africa, but Hannibal's base was the Iberian Peninsula, right? His father Hamilcar had done a lot of conquering around the Iberian Peninsula, and so that's where Hannibal starts. He crosses the Pyrenees, he goes over to the Alps, crosses them, moves his way down the Italian Peninsula, and now he's at the Adriatic. He is a long way from where he began, and looking back, he can't help but think of all of his extremely impressive achievements, his impressive victories, uh, and his achievements, when I say that, I mean both military achievements and more non-military achievements, like crossing the Alps. Truly an impressive journey, and we're nowhere close to done. The horses were bathed in the sour wine, which had been captured in great quantities to restore the condition of their coats. Meanwhile, Publius Cornelius Scipio was sent as proconsul to Iberia, with reinforcements of some 30 new ships, 8,000 troops, and fresh supplies. Publius Scipio is back. I mean, Publius in particular is back, but, you know, you're looking at the Second Punic War, there's always going to be a Scipio somewhere. <laughs> what persuaded the Senate to divert such valuable resources to Iberia at a time when Hannibal was on a path of destruction in Italy? Good was question. Their desire to prevent reinforcements from reaching Hannibal by land. Right. But more importantly, it was the Senate's determination upon a long-term Roman involvement in Iberia, mm. made possible by Gnaeus's success on the battlefield at Taraco and Ebro, as well as his flexible diplomatic methods through which he forged treaties of neutrality and alliances that brought many Iberian tribes to the Roman side. Right. And of course, we saw Hannibal you know, interacting, trying to make alliances with the locals uh, in the Italian peninsula, but it does seem like it's going a little bit better for the Romans uh, out west. And of course, as we know, the Romans certainly will establish a foothold and then a permanent presence in the Iberian peninsula. And it seems like Gnaeus is doing a pretty good job of that. So far, the Scipios haven't had a great time facing Hannibal, but, you know, when Hannibal's in Italy and the Scipios are off doing their own thing, They've been seeing some success. It is Gnaeus' ability to act autonomously without waiting for directives from Rome that gave the Senate a strategic advantage halfway across the Mediterranean, yeah. where they could otherwise exert no direct control. The Senate felt assured that by supporting the Scipio brothers in Iberia, Rome would have good prospects for fighting the Carthaginians in their own backyard. Mm. Back in Italy, with the army restored to health, Hannibal continued advancing down the coast. And as we talked about in the last episode, of course Hannibal is in a very important position. I mean, every move he makes has a massive impact on Rome overall. But Hannibal's still only in one theater of the war, and he can't change that. He can only be one place um, at once, right? And so, regardless of how impressive Hannibal's victories are, there is some limit to their influence because the Romans and the Carthaginians are also fighting in the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, and of course, there's also a lot of naval battles going on, surrounded a lot around some of these islands like Sicily. That's a particularly important one. And so, like I said, you know, no matter how successful Hannibal is, there is a bit of a limit, at least if the Romans are, con you know, willing to continue to fight. You know, Hannibal could completely bring down the Roman regime in Italy, uh, potentially. If the Romans were willing to keep fighting, then they would keep fighting, you know. So, on some level, there's only so much Hannibal can do if he's the only part of the Carthaginian army that's actually getting stuff done. He sent a message by sea to Carthage, reporting on the situation in Italy. The Carthaginian Senate expressed delight with his progress and promised aid to support his campaign. 
Meanwhile, the appointed dictator Quintus Fabius Maximus took command of Geminus's remaining four legions and went after Hannibal. Replacement of the terrible losses at Lake Trasimene required an emergency levy of two additional legions, mm. which brought the dictator's army to around 40,000, including allies. It is possible that some of the new recruits were very young and older men, originally intended for Rome's city garrison, with some in the process of being trained while on the march. Fabius was a man in his late 50s, rather old by the standards of Roman generals, but he was a proven commander. All right, we're going to get a look at Fabius Maximus here. Fabius is going to be one of the most important characters in this whole conflict of the Second Punic War. Uh, I'm not an expert on this conflict. There's a lot I do not know, but Fabius Maximus, I certainly know a bit about him. Uh, he's important, probably one of the more impressive commanders on the Roman side, but I won't say too much because we're going to see his command play out um, over a couple of episodes. Having been awarded a triumph for his victory over the Ligurians during his consulship in 233 BC, he also held the position of censor in 230 and was elected consul again in 228. Now, as dictator, he was yet to reveal his plan on how he will deal with Hannibal. Mm. So far, he had been advancing cautiously, carefully scouting ahead to give himself plenty of warning of the enemy's presence. And his plan, his strategy, is what is going to make Fabius famous. That's what we're going to remember him for, so this is really a key part of his legacy. Meanwhile, Hannibal pillaged and burned his way down the coast accumulating vast quantities of grain, cattle, and other produce. His plan was to reach southern Italy, where he expected to sway some of Rome's allies to join him. Mm. The two commanders met for the first time in northern Apulia, encamping just 10 kilometers apart. Hannibal immediately offered battle outside the Roman camp. But no response came from Fabius. Mm -hmm. The Carthaginian general waited long enough to impress his own men with the enemy's timidity before leading the army back into camp. <laughs> the following morning, Hannibal continued the march, ravaging the countryside. And you might already notice something a little different about Fabius. As we've seen before, the Romans could be very aggressive. Now, some commanders, of course, were more cautious than others, but we've seen several times the Romans march right into a fight that they really should not have marched into. You know, Hannibal has this very impressive skill of baiting the Romans into these pitched battles where he then ambushes them or performs some impressive maneuver to defeat them. And so we're already seeing a bit of a difference. Fabius, for whatever reason, and, you know, if you don't know anything about it, then you won't know from just watching this video, but Fabius has refused that call to battle, that's already a bit unusual for a Roman general. As he went, in an attempt to goad Fabius into battle, he provokingly went past the Roman army back into the Apennine Mountains. But the Roman dictator merely followed the enemy and apparently had no intention of risking a battle under any circumstances. Hmm. This was certainly wise, as nearly half of his army was made up of raw recruits, and some of the men were in awe of Hannibal, who yep. had defeated the Roman armies on three occasions that year. Yep, I mean, not only had he defeated them on three occasions, but these are incredible victories. I mean, especially Trasimene, but all of these were disastrous losses for the Romans. So it's not only that he's beaten them, but Hannibal has beaten the Romans um, at a very impressive level of victory several times now, several times in a short period. So it makes sense that some of these soldiers would be fearful or, like they said, somewhat in awe of Hannibal. But Fabius's strategy wasn't too popular in Rome. Notwithstanding the disasters at the Trebia and Trasimene, powerful elements of the Roman Senate still believed that Hannibal could be defeated in a pitched battle. Okay, and I guess it's worth discussing Fabius' strategy now. 
I was sort of waiting for them to get into it, but I'm not sure if they're going to give the sort of summary uh, that I'm expecting. So, basically, what Fabius did and is going to do is something we now call the Fabian Strategy. <laughs> I wonder where we got that name, huh? Uh, and what he wants to do is basically avoid pitched battles with Hannibal, because he knows he will most likely lose them, and fight a war of attrition. Skirmishes, smaller battles... Harassing the enemy, you know, this is what Fabius wants to do because like I said All of these pitched battles that the Romans have been fighting against Hannibal They've been losing and Fabius knows this and so he wants to try something different But something Fabius is going to come up against a challenge which they have just touched on is that at times This strategy could be very unpopular uh, with everybody <laughs> You know with the soldiers, with the people of Rome, with the politicians, because especially from a Roman perspective, it can appear a little cowardly. You know, we've talked about how the Romans just want to go, go, go. They can be extremely aggressive. You know, they don't want Fabius out in the field, you know, just following Hannibal from behind and waging these small-scale skirmishes. They want him to get in there, attack, and defeat him. And so, at times, Fabius' strategy is quite unpopular, and he will get a lot of pushback, a lot of flack from the elites of Rome. But, remember, at this point, he is dictator. Uh, he's in control, uh, and this is what he's going to try to do. This is the Fabian strategy. Now, uh, I'm not sure if they're going to get into that. <laughs> Maybe I've jumped the gun, but this is what we're going to be seeing from Fabius when he's in charge. Although he was appointed dictator, the Senate restricted Fabius's freedom of action by yeah. denying him the right to choose his own second in command. And so, I think I mentioned when they talked about Fabius being appointed dictator, um, I made the point that I know to us it sounds very negative. We have a negative connotation with the word dictator. But from a Roman perspective, this was a position that was granted People would serve their time as dictator and then give up the power. Not to mention, they didn't even have complete power. Now, they had extraordinary power, absolutely, but there were still some restrictions on them. And that's especially true, I think, if the Senate is unhappy with what you're doing. And we're seeing that here. Instead, they foisted upon him Marcus Manucius Rufus, a former consul. Nevertheless, as Hannibal continued across the Apennines, Fabius shadowed him. The hilly country favored the Romans, allowing Fabius to stick to the high ground and only encamp in positions that Hannibal would never risk attacking. Mm. The dictator's plan was to deprive the enemy of food supplies by launching small-scale attacks on Carthaginian foraging parties, yep. not inflicting many casualties, but making it difficult for them to gather food and fodder. And, I mean, you can see why this is a pretty good idea. <laughs> you know, Fabius doesn't want to lose a big pitched battle against Hannibal, like a lot of his colleagues have. So, this is what he does. He tails behind, you know, has these small skirmishes, attacks the supply lines, and for Hannibal, you know, he is stuck in Roman territory. And while he does have some allies, he's made some allies with the locals, he really doesn't have many supplies to draw on. And so if he's forced to march around the Italian countryside and he can't manage to gather supplies um, or forage because his men are being blocked off by Fabius's skirmishers, then he's going to be in a really tough position. Uh, and of course, Hannibal will want to provoke a big battle to bring this to an end. But if Fabius doesn't take the bait, then Hannibal's in a lot of trouble but he would never risk a direct confrontation. Fabius also instructed inhabitants of surrounding villages to take with them all of the animals and food that they can before mm. destroying and burning everything that's left behind and yep. seek refuge in fortified towns. A and there you go. Don't fight Hannibal, but also don't allow him to gather or forage for supplies. Cut him off completely. This tactic, which would later become known as the Fabian strategy, served yep. not only to deplete Hannibal's forces, but also to gradually rebuild Roman military confidence. 
Hannibal understood that he needed to force an open battle in order to exploit the tactical superiority of his own army mm -hmm. and prevent the situation from developing into an exhausting war of attrition that he cannot sustain. He clearly appreciated the implications to his war effort if Fabius would continue with this new strategy. But the cunning Carthaginian general had a plan. No. Fabius showed great skill to keep close to the enemy without giving him an opportunity to fight. But by the time Hannibal passed the walled city of Beneventum, the Roman army had fallen two days' march behind. All right, I'm curious to see what Hannibal does. Um, like I said, I'm familiar with this Fabian strategy because it's a pretty famous aspect of this conflict, but I do not know the play-by-play, -play, you know, every battle that happened. So I'm real curious to see how Hannibal responds to Fabius because Fabius has been doing a really good job so far of cutting Hannibal off and also not giving Hannibal what he wants, which is this big pitched battle because Hannibal knows that that is where he thrives. The Carthaginian general planned to enter Campania and devastate the Aga Falernus, perhaps the richest area in Rome, famous ah, for its exquisite wines yeah. and fertile land that made it the breadbasket of the Republic. Yeah. He felt that threatening... And, of course, the breadbasket of Rome would change over time. It will be Sicily, and later on it will be Egypt, but Campania will remain a very rich region of the Italian peninsula with a, a lot of rich, wealthy, uh, powerful inhabitants. Threatening such a prominent area, inhabited by Roman citizens, would either provoke Fabius into giving battle or demonstrate at last Rome's weakness, which would hopefully make Capua, Rome's second largest city, switch sides, along with other cities. Upon en I mean, Hannibal's basically putting the Fabian strategy to the test. He's saying, okay, so you don't want to fight. You're letting me march around, burn down your cities as you take the supplies with you. That's fine. Why don't we go to the richest part of your country? Let's try and loot and pillage there and see if you can still hold back from fighting us. You know, th that's basically what he's doing. He's saying, okay, Fabius, I see what you're doing. Let's put it through the test. How far are you willing to go? Entering the valley, Hannibal unleashed his troops, ordering them to strip the region of supplies and then burn all that remained. Mm. Immense amount of valuables were taken as well as vast quantities of supplies and cattle. While Fabius's strategy was already unpopular, now his political power began crumbling as quickly yeah. as the burning rich estates and villas. Damn, and that's the unfortunate thing. You know, Fabius's strategy, it works. Uh, it's a pretty intelligent thing to do, but as I mentioned, it was already inciting opposition from the political elites back in Rome who wanted him to be aggressive, attack Hannibal, you know, do what a Roman general is traditionally supposed to do. But now Hannibal is destroying the estates of these very political elites. <laughs> you know, a lot of these Roman senators probably have farms and villas and estates in this very region that are currently being burned down by the Carthaginians. So Fabius' strategy already was a little shaky, a little unpopular, now, I can imagine, it's incredibly unpopular. But even when urged to seek battle by an angry Manucius, as well as other officers and displeased troops, the under pressure Fabius would have none of it. Wow. Even though the Aga Falernus was burning, it was not enough to bring him down from the hills to challenge the Carthaginians. Okay, Ironically, that's resolved. It seems that Hannibal was the only one who understood the implications of Fabius's plan. Mm. Hannibal failed to provoke an- That's funny. You know, this plan is being used to counter Hannibal. <laughs> and yet, the only person other than Fabius who actually really understands the plan is Hannibal himself. And yet, you know, he's tried to push it to its limits. Limits. Fabius refuses to give in. So now Hannibal's like, well, I know exactly what he's trying to do, but I don't know how to stop him. <laughs> That's kind of funny. An open battle. And despite the vast plunder that was taken, it was clear that he could not winter in the valley, as it couldn't sustain his army until spring. 
Mm. He needed to establish a base where his army could winter and enjoy the spoils of its raiding. Several points led out from the valley, but Fabius had all... And I will say, at this point, I'm kind of wondering, you know, if Hannibal could make some contact with, you know, the other Carthaginian forces, the Carthaginian naval forces, for example. I mean, you know, he's been going up and down the coastline, uh, both coastlines uh, of Italy, both in the east and in the west. Uh, it seems like Hannibal has a bit more room to maneuver, especially now that Fabius doesn't want to attack him head on. I feel like this might be the time to make more contact with, you know, Carthage, with Carthaginian forces, the Carthaginian navy. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if that's going to happen or... Um, if it didn't happen, why not? You know, what the situation is, that's what I'm saying. I'm not familiar with the broader situation at this moment. We're just getting a rather zoomed-in look at Hannibal himself. And, you know, we go back to the Iberian Peninsula every once in a while. ...already strengthened the garrisons on the river to the south and placed small contingents on the eastern and western ends of the valley. Trying to force his way through any of these fortified points would be dangerous for Hannibal. And his plan was to come back the way he came, where he already knew the lay of the land. Mm. But the Roman dictator stationed 4,000 legionnaires on higher ground that would block the pass through which Hannibal intended to exit. And he wow. encamped with the rest of the army on the hillside further west, from where he could attack the Carthaginian rear once they tried to march out of the valley. Mm. Hannibal knew he was hemmed in, and that once his supplies dwindled, he would be forced to launch a direct attack against fortified Roman positions on unfavorable terrain. Yeah, I mean, you know, we haven't seen Fabius conducting a big battle, so we can't necessarily judge how he would do in that, at least at this point, but the positioning that he's gone for is quite impressive. I mean, his strategy in the first place, I think, is a good one. You know, he clearly knows what Hannibal wants to do. He can predict what Hannibal's going to do, at least to a certain extent. And so he's working to counteract that. And now he's positioned his men in such a way that he's given Hannibal a really hard time. Uh, so far, this is probably the most formidable, formidable opponent Hannibal has actually faced. And, of course, funnily enough, they haven't actually faced each other in a battle. Where his cavalry would be unusable. And the longer he waited, the worse his situation would become. So he began making preparations. Finally, a few weeks into the stalemate, Hannibal ordered the troops to eat a hearty supper and go to bed early to get as much rest as possible for the night ahead. All right. As all activities in the three camps quieted down, the guards remained on their posts and the campfires lit up the night sky. It seemed like another uneventful day had ended. But about an hour before daybreak, a mass of torches appeared, heading across a small ridge in front of the pass. Mm. It seemed that Hannibal decided to force his way out after all. Thinking that they were being outflanked, the 4,000 Roman troops holding the pass left their position oh, to block no. the enemy's movement. And I'm pretty sure Fabius would have told them not to do that. <laughs> I reckon he would have said to them, if he could have said to them, he would have said, stay put. Because I don't know what Hannibal's doing right now. Maybe it is as simple as it seems, but with Hannibal, and Fabius would have known this, usually it's not as simple as it seems. He always has a plan in the back of his head that he's going to execute if he gets the chance. So uh, I'm afraid right now that this garrison of Romans is making a big mistake and that they're going to allow Hannibal to escape from the situation. I might be wrong. I guess we'll see. Little did they know that the column of torches weren't enemy soldiers, but thousands of captured oxen <laughs> with burning branches tied to their horns. Oh, guided yeah. Guided by Carthaginian camp followers. Upon reaching the milling animals, the legionnaires halted in confusion. Then, out from the darkness came about 2,000 Iberian javelin men. I mean, you knew Hannibal was up to something. Nothing is ever straightforward with him. And plus, this man cannot resist an ambush if given the opportunity. <laughs> so, even though Fabius knows exactly what Hannibal's all about, you know, Fabius, just like Hannibal, cannot be everywhere at once. 
And so these men, acting without the orders of Fabius, going out on their own volition, have, as usual, been drawn into a trap by Hannibal. Although outnumbered two to one, they were more nimble than the heavily armored Romans and much more accustomed to fighting in the rugged terrain. As the fighting raged on the ridge, Hannibal was already moving with the rest of the army yep. in total silence. He planned to flank the Roman contingent through a very narrow passage that was now left unguarded. <laughs> Fabius saw the torchlight and heard the noise of the fighting, but refused to move from his camp in the darkness, despite the urgings of his officers and Manucius in particular. Mm. Given the problems of fighting a night battle and the relative inexperience of his soldiers, Fabius probably made the correct decision. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm trying to think, was the decision Fabius made the correct one or not? Not that I know really anything about this topic. And I think so. Obviously, you've got Hannibal trapped. In this situation, it's very tempting, especially considering that you have a garrison of men trapped down there. It's, I think it would be very tempting to march down there and confront Hannibal, right? You don't want to waste all this work you've done. But, you know, I think Hannibal wants to escape, but marching down there to fight him, I think would also be giving him exactly what he wants. I mean, that's what Hannibal has, wants, has wanted this whole time, a big pitched battle. At this very moment, he might be trying to escape the situation, but I still would worry that a pitched battle would be to his advantage. And I imagine Fabius is probably thinking, well, you know, this encounter hasn't gone our way, but apart from this one garrison, which is in a lot of trouble, I'm not going to commit any more men, so we're not going to face high losses, and then I just continue my strategy from this point onwards. I mean, we got Hannibal in a really tough position. We've done it before. We can do it again. You know, I just keep up the, you know, quote-unquote Fabian strategy. And I think that would make sense. It's a tough call at this point, absolutely. But I think I agree with the assessment of History March that Fabius probably made the right call. He had no way of knowing whether or not Hannibal was setting up another trap, and it is right. questionable whether the Romans would have been able to locate and intercept the enemy in time. Yeah. And, in and of course, you know, they're going through a narrow pass. Sure, that would have been the perfect time to attack the Carthaginians, but... Would they have been able to find them? We don't know. You know, Fabius didn't know if Hannibal was setting up another trap. You know, there is a lot of stuff going on here. So I do think Fabius probably made the right call with the information available. Sure, if he could have marched down there, known exactly where they were, and caught them as they were going through this narrow pass, that would have been great. But probably couldn't have done that. Indeed, Hannibal was able to ascend the pass without any opposition and escape with his army and plunder intact. As daylight broke, the Carthaginian general reacted quicker than his opponent, sending a force of Iberian infantry from the rear of the column to support the embattled and outnumbered troops on the ridge. Mm. The lightly armed and agile infantry managed to not only relieve the javelin men, but inflicted heavy losses on the Roman contingent. The way in which Hannibal extricated his army from a seemingly hopeless situation became a classic of ancient generalship, finding yeah. its way into nearly every historical narrative of the war and being used by later military manuals. Yeah, and it's an absolutely brilliant move from Hannibal. Once again, even facing an opponent who can read him better than most Romans can, I'll say that about Fabius, Hannibal has still managed to wriggle his way out of this jam he's found himself in. Now, of course, not entirely Fabius' fault. Like I said, I imagine if he would have been with that garrison, he would have told them, stay put. But he wasn't. And of course, Hannibal knows this. You can't be everywhere at once, so he can take advantage of that. Also, the whole ploy was sending the pack animals. Genius. Very impressive victory from Hannibal once again. Fabius had been humiliated for allowing his enemy to escape. Yeah. Even before Aga Falernus, many in Rome and within the army... And that's the thing, you know, this was not entirely Fabius' fault. Um, now, you could have made the argument that maybe he should have acted differently. Maybe he should have sent some support down to that Roman garrison to help them. 
I'm sure there's a lot of things that could have been done differently, but looking at this from the perspective of the Roman Senate, who already does not like this guy, they didn't like him from the beginning because of his strategy, now Hannibal's been burning all their estates down, they really don't like him, and now, what has this new cowardly strategy brought them? Well, Hannibal has managed another victory, and he's escaped from right under Fabius's nose. That's going to look real bad to the Roman Senate and the elites of Rome. I think to us, you know, we can see the wider picture. Also, we're not personally involved, so we can understand why, you know, Fabius is taking a intelligent course of action. You know, his strategy has uh, a lot of rationality to it, but that's not going to make sense to a lot of these senators. He resented the dictator's passive strategy. But while Fabius's political reputation suffered, his troops actually gained valuable experience under his leadership. Hmm. More importantly, he prevented Hannibal from potentially destroying another Roman army, which would have undoubtedly persuaded many of Rome's allies to defect. Yeah. And now he was following... I mean, honestly, <laughs> you know, the Romans have had another encounter with Hannibal. It didn't go well, but this is the least destructive loss that the Romans have faced. <laughs> I mean, Hannibal didn't manage to destroy a Roman army. He didn't manage to inflict an incredible number of casualties. He did manage a daring escape. Very impressive, but this loss that the Romans have endured, it is not nearly as bad as their other losses. So keep that in mind as well. Hannibal back across the Apennines. The two commanders would meet again. Oh, I'm sure they will. All right. That was part eight. Uh, I enjoyed that part. Uh, we finally saw Fabius Maximus appear. We got to talk a bit about the Fabian strategy. I'm sure we'll see more of him down the line. Like I said, I know sort of the general stuff, but I don't know specifically what happened, so uh, I couldn't tell you what will happen when Fabius and Hannibal meet again. Uh, it does seem like Hannibal finally has met someone who is more of an impressive opponent than he's fought up until this point. Uh, you know, I don't want to make Fabius seem more impressive than he is, because Hannibal is incredibly impressive. It is very difficult to live up to him, but Fabius is doing a much better job than most of his Roman colleagues. I'll put it that way. So yeah, interesting episode. We saw Hannibal's usual brilliance, but we saw Fabius, who can at least keep up with him to a certain extent. Uh, if you guys enjoyed this one, please leave a like, subscribe, check out the Patreon, you know, all that good stuff. Anyway, I hope you guys are having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.